Hi, I'm Old Nurse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford, and I'm standing here with Ian McCollum of Forgotten Weapons, another great YouTube channel you ought to check out. And we are in Reykholt, home of Snorri Sturluson. It is my happy, unearned privilege to make my living talking in the mountains about my area of expertise. And the only reason that it's possible at all is because of my Patreon supporters. Today, let me especially single out for thanks Matthew M, Anders N, and Harold K. Thank you so much for your kindness and support, and here's today's video. In fact, the specific site behind me is Snoraloy, very important spot in Snorri's life, which I will get to in a moment. So, who was Snorri Sturluson? I've heard this name before. He yeah. seems important. They have a whole museum here about him. They do. And a actually impressive gift shop. It has actually books in it. Yeah. Like real books. Snorri, I know that kind of sounds like maybe the eighth dwarf or something, right? It, it really kind of does. Yeah. yeah. Common old Icelandic, and in fact, modern Icelandic name. Uh, in fact, you can get it two ways. You can take it as a version of Snothri, which would be like the wise one, but more likely it's just from an old word that means son-in-law. <laughs> uh, so, actually kind of plain name. But he was a member of the Sturlungar, one of the most important families of, I won't say Icelandic nobility because there weren't landed titles in Iceland, but an important wealthy family. And in the 1200s, when Snorri was a young man, the Icelandic Republic that had been established in the Viking Age was falling apart. So the position of Gothi or chieftain could be both inherited and sold. And so over time, a few important families, including notably the Sturlingar, of which Snorri was a part, had bought up all of these chieftaincies. This happens and all it, the time. And it's a bit windy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Weird, Iceland and it's windy. It's a, it's a good thing that I'm pr practiced with windy environments. Um, so, his <laughs> story's goal in particular was to kiss up to the Norwegian king, because of course Iceland had been largely settled by Norwegians. Right. Icelanders still had a lot of family and social and psychological connections to Norway. It made sense that if they were going to be incorporated into some kind of kingdom, it would be the kingdom of Norway. Um, part of his project of kissing up to the kingdom of Norway was writing Heimskringla. Okay. His collection of sagas about the kings of Norway. This begins with Inglinga Saga, giving the mythological roots of the kings of Norway, how they're descended from the gods. And it goes into sagas of each of the kings up to the uh, the king when Snorri was writing it in the 1220s, Magnus. I think it was Magnus. Uh, important source for Norwegian history, even more important source for ancient skaldic poetry, the very elaborate form of poetry used in uh, praising kings and heroes. Okay. And uh, he wrote probably most famously the prose Edda. Of course, he just called it Edda. Okay. What does um, that actually translate to? What does that mean? A lot of disagreement about this. Yeah. Um, I think that the most economical explanation is that it is simply the old Icelandic word Edda, which means great grandmother. Hmm. So it's like okay. lore that your great grandmother might have told you. There are other explanations, but I, I like Occam's razor in just saying this is it, it's it's the same as the regular word. He just called the book Edda. Um, it consists mostly, in fact, of a poetry manual. He wanted to teach Icelanders of his day, who were starting to favor new forms of literature from the continent, ballads. Uh, inspired by French and English originals about the uh, Knights of the Round Table. Well, he wanted to encourage people to write or compose traditional Norse poetry, but to do that, he also had to explain the mythology. Now, Snorri is a medieval Christian, so he has a very systematized idea of what, uh, you know, of what religious lore ought to look like. But if you ever read the Poetic Edda, which is a compilation of poems that actually survive from pre-Christian times, you see that they don't agree with one another. You know, who is whose father, who did what, who's married to who. These things vary from place to place. Snorri has a hard time with those contradictions and tries to kind of smash them into one cohesive narrative. Okay. 
That makes the prose edda probably the most approachable way to read Norse mythology in terms of what's available from the Middle Ages, but it's still more like an original secondary source than a primary source. Okay. And very often we can actually see exactly where he's getting his stories because he's nearly quoting hmm. the poetic edda. But of course he quotes many poems that didn't make it into that compilation. So sometimes he's our only source for, for a story. For example, he's our only source for the story of Baldur's death okay. from Iceland. There's a version from Denmark too, but but that's uh, an important myth that we don't have told in any detail in the poetic edda. So sometimes he, he's really just the source. So it's interesting. It sounds like he was both like major political player yeah. and also major academic scholar writer yep. Yep. at the same time. Yeah, a combination that you so seldom see. Someone who's absolutely engaged at the top level with affairs of the day, but also just a genuinely fascinated man of letters, right? And a good poet. A lot of the prose edda consists of his own original poetry too. When he's demonstrating, like how to how to d use this style of alliteration or this style of rhyme or something, he's 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 a virtuoso. Okay. Uh, so an, obviously a Renaissance man of incredible talents. Um, in some ways, it's really a tragedy that he was so involved in politics. I think that he could have had a career as a writer for much longer, but he fell afoul of the Norwegian king, and in 1241, men hired uh, by the Norwegian king assassinated him, according to the story, right here. Right uh, down there. Yeah. And his last words, which I think are strikingly, amazingly human and real sounding, are Eki skal hukva, Eki skal hukva. Don't cut, don't cut. Don't cut me, bro. Yeah. <laughs> don't stab me, bro. Right. And, 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 but they did. Yes. Uh, and so that's recorded by his nephew, Sturla Thorthus. And uh, I tend to think that that part of the story has to be pretty close to literally true, because that's not what you make up as somebody's last words. Uh, it's not really all that glamorous. No. I know when I thought I was dying, I definitely was closer to that than, you know... You'll some, never take me alive! <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> or some grand declamation that you see in the sagas about, like, you know, my wife chose well, <laughs> or something of that kind. So there was an interesting, we were talking about this a bit off camera, but um, Snorri was a medieval Christian writing yep. in the 1200s, but writing about the, the stories of the Norse gods mm -hmm. and what would have been to him the, the pagan religion. Right. Does that imply that he is Christianizing those stories? Or what's, like, do we have any idea what his motive was in recording those stories? I would say it's pure antiquarian interest. He, Iceland doesn't have the same high stakes conflict ridden conversion. Iceland converts essentially voluntarily by a decision of parliament. We were actually just at Thingvellir where this very decision happened in the year 1000. There were some people living as Christians, some people living as heathens, and it had gotten to be about half and half by just voluntary conversion. And so there, it was felt that the country couldn't live under two sets of laws given that law is mostly based on religion at this time. Yeah. And so, uh, I mean, it's his own story that doesn't have a whole lot to do with Snorri Sturluson, but the country became Christian basically by kind of like a common legislative decision. So there's not the same hostility toward the old gods. People remember them, well, they certainly remember that their ancestors worshiped different gods. And there's so much fascination with that period of their history, especially it seems like during the 1200s when we have this period of civil war, people are looking back at a better time when men were men, right? When those conflicts were a little bit more romantic. It's maybe contrast the way that, you know, you might live in a gang-ridden part of a city today, but look back kind of romantically at World War II or something like that. Okay. Uh, or I think that it's actually very similar to the way that we glorify the American West, right? A violent time, but it's like more romantically violent. Okay. And right. Snorri just thought this was 
really cool stuff and it shouldn't yeah. be forgotten and it's right exactly okay and he writes in his prologue to the prose edda he says you know god created the earth in seven days and adam and eve were the first people right pretty standard christian uh intro to history but then he says up in the north people forgot hmm. it's not the devil misled them it's nothing you know he doesn't say they were stupid he just said they forgot they forgot and they came up with all this cool stuff that i'm going to record for posterity yeah that's pretty cool yeah and in fact he's a very medieval christian in the way that he explains that um he wants the norse gods to be the trojans okay this is a really common trope in the middle ages where people knew who the greeks were but it's like who's the trojans and so everyone you know from the albanians it's a real example from the Albani albanians to the welsh said we're the trojans <laughs> so snorri's argument is actually the norse gods are the trojans so he says like hector is thor <laughs> Intro, okay. Yeah, is this after the Trojan War that came north? I mean, this has nothing to do with the actual origins of Norse mythology. Sure. Sometimes that confuses people. But that's how he tries to explain it and kind of rationalize it in his medieval Christian well, it's, way. It's fascinating to see this from other perspectives like his. Yeah. Yeah. And he's actually kind of showing off how integrated he is into, you know, contemporary Christian European learning. Yeah. Right? He's read, maybe not the Iliad, but he's read some classical works where these stories are told. So... He wants... I think there's so many people out there, probably very few of them in your audience, who realize that like the Viking Age and Medieval Europe are, in many ways, they're the same... You know, at one point, they are the same time frame. Mm -hmm. And Iceland is part of Europe, and Scandinavia is part of Europe. Of and the two very much overlap. And yep. obviously, it's something that you realize. But I think to a lot of people out there, they're like, wait, Vikings knew about the Odyssey? That's right. right. I think you're right. Well, and, and I was thinking about that uh, about a week ago in Norway. I was looking at the law code from about Snorri's lifetime. And uh, there's a little drawing in the margin of two knights jousting. <laughs> and you think, this is Old Norse, the language of the Vikings. And here in their law code, somebody just, you know, doodled some guys <laughs> playing Renfest. Yeah, we don't think of those worlds colliding that much, but they got pretty close to colliding yeah. in the medieval north. Oh, fascinating. And Snorri is part of that collision. All right. Yeah. Well, we got a lot more things to see, I suspect. We absolutely do. But for me, very special to be at the home of Snorri, a person I regard as an inspiration. Uh, you know, in a lot of ways, I think that he is the first person to do what I am doing. For that, <laughs> for that blasphemy. <laughs> oh my gosh, that was actually pretty funny. For that blasphemy or arrogance, my tripod got knocked over. I don't mean to compare myself to him exactly. What I mean is, he's the first person who stands outside of the living tradition of Norse mythology who's trying to explain it for another period. I'm trying to do the same thing. Less well, Ghost of Snorri, or whoever knocked over my, <laughs> my tripod. But he is, in a, in, a, in a lot of ways, the founder of my field. He's the first student of Norse mythology who doesn't, who's not, again, a worshiper of the Norse gods. All right, well, thank you so much, Ian. Absolutely. And from beautiful Reykholt, we're wishing you all the best. <laughs>